everybody. Welcome to Perpetual Motion, a podcast focused on lifestyle, self-care, personal empowerment, and positive relationships. I am your host, Dr. Mo Anderson, and in each episode, I interview thought leaders from all over the world who share tips, tools, and techniques that will add immediate value to your personal and professional growth. If that sounds good to you, stay tuned, turn up the volume, and hit that subscribe button now, please, so we can remain connected. Joining me now is Sylvia Dutkevich, an author, educator, and psychotherapist who has lectured and presented throughout the United States on critical therapy, including at Fordham and NYU. She is a boss, y'all, but very engaging and interesting, so don't be frightened by her amazing credentials. She has also been featured in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Psychology Today, and many other esteemed publications. Today, we're chatting about how race, class, gender, and religion intersect with psychological conflicts. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you, Dr. Mo. Thanks for having me here. It's great to be with you. I I am thrilled since our pre-call. I I told you when we had the pre-call that even I was intimidated by your CV, and it takes a lot to intimidate me. But then we talked, and you are so, I mean, down to earth, and you present this information that is very complex in a way that's understandable, and I'm just thrilled that we connected. Well, You're thank by- you. And, you know, I do want to start off by saying that after we talked, I did watch your TED Talk. And it is so awesome. I love the way you connected dentistry with racism and sort of like the bigger picture and made it all so simple. Um, so I, I, I encourage everyone who is listening to your podcast to also watch that talk and to really listen to you because you have a lot of important and interesting ways of helping us to really look at a problem that is all over and that we need to solve. And I think the more um, unique ideas we have in trying to end, I don't know if we could end racism in this lifetime, but the more we try to fight against it, the better off we will all be. Absolutely. What, What a very kind and gracious thing for you to say. And thank you. Thank you for listening. I am trying to get the word out about it. And as you know, the title is How Dentistry Teaches Us to Curb Racism because bias is, you know, inherent in all of us. It's going to be here, but we can work together and do better. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Sylvia. Your bio says you created critical therapy. What is that exactly? And how is it different than other psychotherapies? So critical therapy is a practice. It's also a moral project. And what we mean by that is that we have a deep commitment to human liberation. I created critical therapy, honestly, because I was dissatisfied with the way psychotherapy does not engage with our political realities. How we, especially now, we talk about issues around race, class, and gender, but only if the patient brings it into the psychotherapeutic hour. However, Racism, classism, sexism is always with us and is impacting the way we show up in society. Also, Mm -hmm. therapy or psychotherapy precisely claims to be neutral, right? We are trained to believe that as therapists, we don't carry our values or our ideology, as we call it, into the therapy room. However, as we know from all the work on intersectionalities, our many identities are always already present in the room. The way that I present as a therapist, the way you present as a uh, patient influences the way we interact. And what I Mm -hmm. mean by present is, you know, the fact that I'm a woman, the fact that I'm a white woman, the fact that you may be a male, the fact that you may be a black man and so forth. All these things intersect and interact not only on a conscious level, but Mm -hmm. also on a subconscious level. So it's important to engage with it and it's important to talk about it. That, that is so true. And, and for so long, we've tried to silo the different aspects of our personalities, of our backgrounds, of our culture, and it's, you know, inextricable. So I, th- I, I love that when you, when you, you know, when I first read it, when you told me about it, I was like, now this makes sense to me. And this also makes sense in terms of therapy that I've had in the past while I gravitate 
to certain people and just felt like they connected with me better. Right. And also the the other thing is we we engage with political issues and what we mean by that is not necessarily who you voted for or what mm-hmm. party you belong to, but how do issues such as access to medical care, access to um you know, parental leave, um, workers' rights, how do those impact your psychic and mental health wellness? Because they do. For example, if you're a woman and you have very little maternity leave and you have to leave your baby at home, or if you're a male or, you know, who, who has a child and wants to spend time and take care of your child, but you need to go to work, that impacts your mental health. It does. It really does. And in, in so many other countries, they have, you know, extended parental leave for both mother and father. So I'm wondering, do they, is that just tradition or do you think other places have gotten that before the U.S., before Western culture? Well, I think they've gotten that because they're committed to children. In the United States, Mm. I'm fascinated by our claim that we care about children. And we seem to care about them when they're fetuses, right? There's so much out there, pro-choice, pro-life, pro-this. And yet, once we have a child, we give very little support to parents and families to take care of that child. We don't give them paternal leave. We don't give them money. We don't sustain them. So it's amazing to me how politicians and, you know, most of us fight over these sort of so-called rights of of, of this unborn child. And yet, when this child is born, we do very little to help them be successful later on in life. Oh, wow. That is so true and so deep. I'll be thinking about that all week. That's, that's an excellent point. You, you've explained what critical therapy is, but what inspired you personally to create critical therapy? Oh, I, I you know, it's a very interesting question. I think it's a combination of my personal sort of history combined with, you know, my schooling. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that I am a refugee from Romania. I came uh, in the 80s when Romania was still one of the most brutal dictatorship on the Eastern Bloc. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't think it's a coincidence that I am very painfully and acutely aware how personal issues are always intertwined with political realities. Um, I was also working for some time at domestic violence agencies, and I've worked with, unfortunately, mostly women who Mm -hmm. were escaping domestic violence situations. And through that counseling, I discovered how power is such an important part of every relationship, and it's such an important part of therapy. And yet we don't talk about it. We don't know how to really use power. We talk a lot, you know, especially social workers talk a lot about empowerment. And yet we are not very good at talking about power. How does empowerment happen? First of all, no Mm -hmm. one empowers anyone. We empower ourselves. And I think especially for people who have been marginalized, therapy should offer you that space where you learn to empower with another and you learn how to use power that's collaborative. We, we have models of power that are really power over uh, and that's what happens in therapy, right? So what happens in therapy in traditional therapy is you go to a therapist, you talk about yourself most of the time, you deal with all your intra-psychic problems. And yet when you come out of therapy, you don't really know how to have a relationship because nowhere else in the world, a relationship consists of only you and your issues. So. <laughs> You know, like it it just won't work. (laughs) This is true. So I think part of our job as psychotherapists is to learn how to share power with our patients, teach them how to be collaborative, teach them how to talk about uncomfortable issues, teach them how to sometimes sit in a room with someone who might have very, you know, very different views than you. I think that's important. And I think therapy doesn't get to do that in traditional, you know, schools. You are right. And that's important on every level, whether it's at the job, sitting around the conference table or, you know, happy hour with your girlfriends or, you know, particularly those personal relationships. And I can say from experience that that is a problem when you're just dealing with your issues inside your head and you don't know how to communicate to your significant other. This 
this is just revolutionary to me <laughs> to hear a psychotherapist speaking this way. I, I've never heard anyone uh, speak about it in this manner. You, you alluded to being an immigrant or refugee. I'm not mm-hmm. sure which term to use from Romania. Mm-hmm. How did that experience, you know, for you as an individual, how did that influence your theory? Um, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that one of our commitment is to human liberation and Mm -hmm. that we're always, I think as a therapist, but I think as a human being, we should always align ourselves with the oppressed and the marginalized. And a way to do that in your everyday life is I often say this to people, whenever you find yourself on the side of the powerful, stop for a second and question why you're there. Is it because it's comfortable? Is it because you want to have that power? Is that really an ethical decision to create a better world or to be a better person? Or is it because it's just easy? So I think all those those things have influenced me creating, you know, critical therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Also, as an immigrant, I've lived in, you know, so many uh, different um, social classes. You know, I was one of those people who we didn't leave Romania for economic reasons. Um, We were actually well off. It was for political reasons. And honestly, because my father would have gotten arrested at some point. Um, Mm -hmm. And when we came here, we didn't we didn't have money. We were, you know, poor. Um, And now through my work and through the privileges I've had. And what I mean by that is, you know, the fact that my father was well educated, the fact that I got to go to college, the fact that I'm, you know, a white lady, let's face it. Um, And I was the right, quote unquote, kind of immigrant, you know, from Eastern Europe. Um, All those things, including my hard work and so forth, have helped me to get to a place where now I'm comfortable and I'm, you know, in a better class. So I am acutely aware of how money influences the way we show up in the world and how money should also be part of a critical conversation in psychotherapy. One of the amazing things to me is that oftentimes in psychotherapy, affluent people don't get to talk about money. And the reason that is, is because you usually go to a therapist and if you have good insurance or if you have money, you just pay their fee. If you don't, then you get into this sliding scale, which is we're going to lower our fee to accommodate you. So mm-hmm. as you can see, affluent people never discuss their relationship to money. And I think that that's a missed opportunity. One of the things that we do at Critical Therapy is our sessions. You know, people ask us, how much does it cost to you know, see a critical therapist? Um, and the cost is always based on your income and resources, meaning that everyone pays the same percentage of their income and resources for our psychotherapy hour, meaning that people could pay $25 or, you know, $3,000, for example. Um, and we do that obviously because it's fair if you think about it, right? Everyone pays according to their income and resources. We also do that because we believe that therapists should be able to make a decent living and be able to see people who are less affluent. Mm -hmm. And what I've discovered after having done this for 10 years is conversations about money are never about money. Conversations about money are often about privilege, your self-worth, your relationship to your parents, shame. Um, So I think traditional psychotherapists, by not discussing money, have missed or missed opportunities to interrogate one's relationship to their status, to their wealth, to their class. That's that's interesting. That's really interesting. And I like that uh, unique sliding scale. And you talk about it in your book, Critical Therapy, Power and Liberation in psychotherapy. And you also refer to the politics of equity. Can you elaborate? Mm-hmm. You, you've touched on it a little, a little bit, but the politics of equity is, is really important. Yeah, everybody talks about equality as if somehow there is a leveled playing field and we should all be equal. The truth is, after so many, you know, sort of history of, of years and decades of colonialism, racism and sexism, we're not equal, we're not anywhere near. And if we want to create a more equitable society, meaning that everyone could have the same chances, the same opportunities, it will look different. To use you know, critical therapy and the sliding scale, and it's a very simple example, is 
it, it may not seem fair to you when you first hear it. Like, wait a minute, I pay $25 and you pay, you know, $5,000. That doesn't seem fair. And yet, if you look at each person's income and resources, it's the same percentage. So it's actually fair. That's what equity looks like. So okay. equality would be, we all pay $50, but that mm -hmm. would privilege the person who makes 10 times more than you do. So therefore we want to make sure that all of us are able to pay our fair share, right? We talk about that a lot in politics in American society, right. but we don't actually mean it because as soon as we ask people how much money they make and you know, how do we divide this? People get very uncomfortable. Um, and income I joke, taxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I joke about this, you know, I, you know, when people <laughs> go on a first date, who pays? Mm -hmm. So of course I said, well, wouldn't that be an interesting conversation to be like, well, let's say how much money do you make? How much money do I make? And we should really split it equitably. Now, of course, that would be a disastrous conversation because we are so uncomfortable talking about money, let alone on the first date. I mean, let me ask you, how many, how much, how much do you know about your friends and their, how much money they're making? You, we don't get to ask very, our friends. Very little. No, we right. don't. We don't. We might talk about investments. Uh, yeah. You know, we talk about things, purchasing, but not income. No, you're you're right about that. We always allude to it. it it's mm -hmm. fascinating to me in therapy or even outside of therapy. You have people, including our friends, who talk about their most intimate issues. Sometimes they talk about sex. Sometimes they mm -hmm. talk about marital problems and so forth. And all of a sudden, they bring something up about money or their bills. And I say, well, how much money do you make? And there's that... And that and, expression and on what? their face, I, I got it from, I was just at one point, I was trying to budget and I'm like, I really don't even know what the range is, <laughs> you know, what? Like, what are my friends doing with comparable income? What are they spending a money? Am I, am I setting a realistic goal? And I, I just ask a few friends, not what they make, but what they spend a month. And it, they just, it threw them for such a loop that I would asked that like it was so personal and invasive and i didn't think so at all i was willing to share but yeah that's crazy wow yeah and and the truth is it's not personal and invasive it's and it's because it's tied to our worth it's because oh. it might be tied to shame if i have mm -hmm. too much money i don't have enough money also mm -hmm. there's this myth in our society that somehow if you're poor it's your fault you didn't work hard enough or you right. weren't dedicated enough or you're not mm -hmm. saving enough. I mean, I have mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, patients sometimes who come in who don't have enough money and they're like, oh, I'm just not saving enough. And I said, well, let's stop. How much money are you actually making and what are your bills? And now let's look, is this realistic for you to save or should we interrogate why we continue to live in a world that don't pay workers enough to have a comfortable life? Yeah. Wow. That, that is an important conversation. Now I'm seeing how this all comes together. I want to jump back to something. You mentioned uh, the words equity and privilege, and those are just taking on, and, and some other terms are just, to me, being flipped upside down by politicians. And they're becoming such, you know, we're putting these negative connotations on them that I, I don't think are inherent to the words. What, what is this about? Is this part of the power of politics? It's like every time we bring up something about equity, all of a sudden it turns into a, a negative thing. Well, we, you know, we sort of co-opted those words. We're, we're also, uh, a, I think, a country, but probably it's worldwide, a generation of we, we just love sound bites. And it's really hard to have conversations with sound bites because they're mm -hmm. not meaningful conversations. Mm -hmm. And I also think we all want to use those words. And look, I'm a therapist, so I believe in the best of in everyone. I start from the assumption that most people want to do good and want to be nice people. I also think we don't educate people. And because we have these values, right? Like, you know, I, and I, I say values because it's really ideology, but that's a buzzword and people don't like it. And right. we have these <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, ideology, no values. And what I mean by values are not a positive thing. So racism is a value we all share. It's a negative value, but we all have it. And mm -hmm. people, of course, are like, no, I'm not a racist. That's not me. And yet somewhere deep down in all of us, there is a racist part of us because our system, our society is racist. 
So we're not outside of it. And this is not that argument that racism affects everyone, but it does. It mm -hmm. affects everyone at different levels. So therefore, instead of shaming ourselves and being like, oh my God, no, I'm not a racist. That's a bad thing. I think we should all own up to it and, and switch the conversation to how can I do better? How can I do something different? And it's the same with privilege. I think privilege, you are correct. Everyone's throwing privilege. No one wants to be privileged anymore. And, and, and it's like, oh, no, I'm not privileged. Let me find something I'm not privileged at and tell you about it. Which, you know, I, I've seen this happen now, especially, you know, in some of the left wing circles, like to be privileged is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. which is the same with having money. And this is why some people who are rich don't want to show that they have money. I would like to shift the conversation or change it differently to say that with privilege, as with power comes responsibility. Yes. I cannot take away my privilege. I cannot all of a sudden look different. I cannot all of a sudden not be educated. But because I am those things, I can internalize that and think of it not as, oh my God, I have privilege, I'm a bad person, but I have privilege, I have a responsibility to help other people who don't. I have a responsibility to change the world for the better. Mm. You, you just said privilege, I cannot look different. I've always thought of privilege in terms of assets or education. What, how does privilege come into our appearance? Oh, I'm, you know, uh, beauty, how well you, if you considered, you, you know, if you're considered traditionally beauty, thin, whatever, ah, but I, yes. but also it's privilege in, in, in this conversation, you and I, if we go for a job, the fact that I'm white might actually help me. I mean, at some point, right. Um, I remember this was about, I think maybe 20 years ago, it's, I realized that most of the jobs that I applied to all the people I interviewed with were white. Now, mm -hmm. sure, I did get those jobs because I'm smart and I'm hardworking, and I can't help but wonder what percentage of the fact that I looked like the person who interviewed me helped me get that job. Right. So that's privilege. It's just, I mean, think about, gotcha. think about being, gotcha. and not only that, think about being a black man in America and walking down the street. Trust me, how you look matters. I have two adult sons, and and. Yes. And, and even the things they tell me that I wasn't aware of as much as their father and I tried to prepare them, the people getting off elevators, or, you know, we were at a spa one time, people would leave the rooms when they walked in and, you know, next to nothing, like what in the world do you think is going to happen to you? And it just, it, it breaks my heart. And I have a low level of fear, even though they're in their thirties, yeah. because of the things that I constantly see and read about. So yeah, and, yeah, and this is a good example of how those realities are always tied with mental health. So mm -hmm. the question to me is, what happens to your sons, right? The fact that they know this, they are living this experience, it must affect their mental health. But I also want to go further and ask, what happens to that person who is in the elevator? What brought them to the place where they're like, this person is unsafe? What values, what have we done to people that you think you're superior just because you look different? And, yes. and so, you know, we often think of racism, sexism, and so forth through the lens of the other, right? Oh, of course, we're women. We should talk about sexism because it affects us. Well, I encourage all men to talk about sexism because it also impacts them. It doesn't impact them the same way, but it does impact them in how they have to show up as a man. What has it been to be masculine enough? Do you, how do you spend time with your children? One of the things that uh, I discovered, this was many years ago, I used to work for the Miss Foundation for Women. And the Miss Foundation for Women created back then, Take Our Daughters to Work Day. And it was a day where, you know, people brought their daughters to work so that little girls could see what they could be, because you can't right. be what you can't see, right? Exactly. Um, so what was surprising is after they've done this was when they got the reports back from people, especially from men, they got letters and they got phone calls. They said that men said, thank you for allowing me for the first time in my life to be a public father. Now, this was in the 80s, sure. but still... You know, the fact that we we live in a society that we constrict people to live a certain way and, and that impacts our mental health. And this is why politics or the political rather is so intertwined with mental health. Oh, 
Do, do you teach? Are you an instructor, Sylvia? I teach at Critical Therapy. I teach some of the classes. So we train uh, social workers or therapists, counselors who want to train yeah. in critical therapy. Yeah. And I ask because this is so fascinating. I, I'm a voracious learner, intellectual tourist, and just things going all through my head. And I was just thinking, wow, I would love to be in one of your <laughs> classes. You. you just are making this also engaging for me a topic that I don't know a lot about, but I feel like I'm understanding, you know, the way you present it and your analogies. And I, I got to touch on one more thing before uh, we talk about your book a little bit. I agree. And, and as you know, I say in my talk that we, you know, all have unconscious bias. And you said, if I heard you correctly, that we're all racist. And I guess I'm thinking now, what is the difference between practicing racism and being racist. I think I was kind of thinking of those as the same thing. Well, I think if we that have question done, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does make sense. Um, I think why I say we're all racist is because we live in in environments that teach us about racism from a very early age, right? That true, teach us that true. certain people are less than. And mm -hmm. even though we try hard not to practice those, sometimes we police ourselves, we don't embody the belief that we're all the same. This is one of the things where I think psychotherapy can offer a, an opportunity for all of us to change, right? We, we say, I say critical therapy, you know, um, works at changing individuals who change the world, right? Because right. we could all talk about, we could all be anti-racist on paper, we could all agree to the values of equity. We could all agree that, you know, women should be equal to men. And yet, somewhere deep down in our hearts, we don't embody that. And not because we're bad people, but because we have had years of messaging. One mm -hmm. of the things about ideology or about values that we don't realize is that what we think might, act, might not actually be how we feel. I'll give you a very simple example. Just the other day, I had a patient that I was on the phone with. She's a new mom and she decided to stay home for six months to take care of her child. She's obviously, you know, also a feminist. And she tells me, no, Sylvia, this is going to be the most important job. I am actually molding a human. This is great. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Great. That's her value, right? So that's what right. she believes or she thinks she believes. And yet, over the past few months, we spent countless hours where she says, I feel worthless. What am I actually doing? I'm home mm. in my pajamas. I'm just sitting with this baby. Because what she actually thinks she believes, which is what she's learned in school as an older individual, doesn't match what she learned earlier on and the messages we keep getting in our society. So therapy could be that place, and obviously it is for us, where mm -hmm. we look at but girl, what you actually say you believe, you're not embodied. You don't live those, those values. Whose values are you actually living? Whose life are you comparing yourself to? Because it's not the person that you think you want to be or you mm -hmm. are. It's someone else's narrative. Wow. Someone else's narrative. So many of us are on that journey. And, you know, awareness is the first step to change a direction. So I, I, I like that. I like what, what you said, and I, and I do see that with my friends, male and female, who are, you know, homemakers and raising children, which I think is quite the most important thing a parent can mm -hmm. do. But, and, you know, they always talk about if they had to compensate full-time parents that most of us couldn't afford a mother and a father. <laughs> so. That's true. And they should, because that's how we value, right? Again, we go yes. back to value. Unless you make money, you're not producing anything. I mean, you're actually loving and helping the next generation so we could live in a better world, but we don't think of it that way. You know? Right. We don't. We don't. And, and it's reflected in our educators pay too, but that's another topic. We are yeah. going to have to have you back because there's so <laughs> many more things I want to talk about. But before we go, please tell us a bit about uh, your book and how listeners can get a copy of it. 
So Critical Therapy, Power and Liberation in Psychotherapy is a very short book, and that was done on purpose so it could be accessible to everyone. You could find it in some local stores. Um, you could also find it on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, and all the major you know, retailers. The mm -hmm. book really describes my work and our work at Critical Therapy for the past 10 years. Um, it actually gives you a case example of working with a patient. Um, it also talks about love and psychotherapy. Um, most people shy away from love in psychotherapy, but I think it's that one ingredient that heals because ultimately therapy is a very human experience. You know, we, mm -hmm. we say we go to therapy because we're depressed or because we're, you know, sad or we suffer from anxiety, which is true. But ultimately at the core of most of our problems are existential problems you know, mm -hmm. about the world we live in, who we are yes. in this world and so forth. Um, so the book is very easy to read. Um, I encourage you to read it. I also encourage you, I don't know if you could tell this about me, but I love talking with people. So if you have any comments or, um, you know, ideas that inspire you or don't inspire you or criticism, that's fine too. Please reach out to me. I, I, I love to engage with people. Because I think that's how we grow. It's by having conversations. It's by listening to ideas that I couldn't have thought on my own. I, I, I say this. I didn't come up with critical therapy. I think my patients helped me put it all together. Nice. Nobody does anything alone. That's You're a right. myth. You know, right. even the book. I didn't write the book. I mean, the people who brought me groceries from Fresh Direct helped me write the, <laughs> that book. Honestly, you know, it gave me yeah. time. I didn't have to go to grocery shop. Yeah, that's made with DoorDash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> understood it's, it's it's a whole big community and collaboration and people supporting you whether you realize it or not that helps any of us do anything and you have certainly helped me and i think the listeners here today understand a bit more about psychotherapy and a bit more about ourselves and i encourage everyone to go out and, and download or get a copy of your book we'll drop that in the show notes uh, with a, a link and also that'll get them to your website and they can learn more. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sylvia, for making this complex topic understandable and engaging. Continued success in your work. Oh, thank you so much. And I love your show. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs>